Thanks for the warning. Yeah. Hold on. Let me bring that back. Yep. Let me bring that back one more time. Good thing we got the NVIDIA. All right. Let us start. So today, um, with our social distancing Indiana FileMaker developer group session, we are going to be uh, going over a little bit about us, DB Services uh, and me. Then the FileMaker 19, uh, I'll have a little bit of a demo for you guys. And then there's a little bit of additional information about FileMaker 19 after that. And then time for QA. So I'm sure we'll have some time for QA. Um, first, about DB Services, uh, we are a team of analysts, developers, and designers focused on creating custom software to support uh, and improve your organization's workflow. Uh, we are a Platinum Claris partner, a three times growth partner of the year, and maybe four, we'll find out uh, if we have another DevCon. Uh, we have 18 certified developers, I believe. If you're not part of our newsletter, uh, you should be getting on that. There's a lot of good stuff on here, including a lot of the things that we talk about here about the new things that are in FileMaker. And once a month, we put out some good stuff out there. So make sure you are on our newsletter. And uh, if you want to learn any more, go to DB Services. You can check out the our website, and uh, there's more information there. Uh, me, myself. I am a technical project manager at DB Services. I'm certified in FileMaker 12 to 18. I've been with DB Services since 2013. I am a Purdue grad, and I am a recent first-time father of this four-month-old boy, Logan. Uh, he smiles a lot, so it wasn't hard finding a picture where he is smiling. It's really hard to find the picture where he doesn't have spit up on him. So this was one of the best ones I could find that we, <laughs> was recent. So. Um, he's pretty cute. Uh, other than being a father, I'm into uh, traveling, going around the world, normally includes hiking, um, flying, either airplanes themselves, or I've got little smaller remote control airplanes and drones, and just general shenanigans and, you know, causing chaos, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's me. Let's talk about FileMaker 19, um, which... Most of you have probably know by now, um, FileMaker has been rebranded to Claris. Uh, so now it's the Claris, or FileMaker is a product of Claris. Uh, moving away from annual re releases, uh, they'll be doing more just updates, new features as we go, or as they come up with them. So that's going to be good stuff there. And um, in this release, you can extend the platform using artificial intelligence. Uh, there's some cool JavaScript integrations, um, making it easier to have packaged add-ons. And uh, with that JavaScript, having more um, pretty designs, I guess, a, a file maker with more modern looks. And before we begin, I know most of you have used FileMaker 19. Um, I think I heard someone here, they have it downloaded, but they haven't really used it yet. Uh, is there anyone other than the person I was talking to earlier not used FileMaker 19? Cool. Okay. Um, where is my third? Okay. So I'm going to start off with the JavaScript side of things. I know at DB Services, that was the most exciting thing, at least for me. And I feel like a lot of people at DB Services, um, that was pretty exciting to have that. Um, rather, there are the fun functions that I'm about to talk about here, um, rather than having the FMP URLs and that sort of thing. So with FileMaker 19, uh, there's some new native JavaScript uh, JavaScript script steps and functions that are built in. Uh, you can directly embed things in your app like maps or animated graphics or graphs themselves. Um, JavaScript has a large community of developers, so there's a lot of things out there that you'll just be able to find online and just drop it into FileMaker. So there's a lot of cool features that you wouldn't find in FileMaker until we had this kind of stuff. The there's JavaScript libraries out there. We actually have an article on there on our website about Vue.js that I uh, would recommend using that. It works really well inside of the web viewers, and you can find some really great 
stuff that's just pre-built for you uh, that's open source that you can easily update and make it your own. Uh, but this allows you to continue to build custom apps that are reliable, they work, um, but they're also up to the latest design trends that customers are wanting and expect in your apps. I do want to mention that, you know, as I said before, it was possible to do JavaScript integrations with uh, FMP URLs and you can use hashing to go both ways, but it was clunky if you had multiple versions of FileMaker like we do. It always opened the wrong one, and so it just caused bugs or problems, and it just didn't work very well. So with FileMaker 19, they've added this perform JavaScript in the uh, in Web Viewer script step, which lets you do something inside of the JavaScript Web Viewer. Um, this helps you. This saves a lot of time, makes it stable, easier to understand, and it works on Pro, Go, WebDirect, all that fun stuff. And then they also added inside of the web viewer itself the ability to do a filemaker.perform script function which lets you communicate with filemaker from web viewer to you know running a filemaker script um i'll have an example of this later in the demo but as you can see here in the code there's that function just filemaker.perform script that's just a that's the function built um Another thing that they've added here is the ability to add a package. So um, FileMaker in the past has been becoming more dedicated towards adding XML representation of the platform. Uh, a few versions back, so we had the add-on tables. So now they've added not just the tables, but you can have a whole new component that you can add into a system. You can create reusable code um, for faster development or if you have some kind of fee-based app, you can make this as like an extension to your app that can easily be bolted in. It currently is in a preview function, uh, which basically just means it's beta, not real. It's going to be changed or improved in the future, but it is available now for you to test with and use. In the future, there will be, as I was mentioning before with the JavaScript functions, there will be JavaScript add-ons where you can just you take something cool that you built and save it and make it so that you can easily drag and drop it into other systems um, as an add-on. Honestly, myself, I know I've been asked by other customers many times and, you know, can I have a calendar, that sort of thing. So it'd be pretty great to just have something where, yeah, I have a calendar. Let me just drag and drop it in here as if it was like a FileMaker object where, uh, you know, it's just, there's really no development time. It's just there for you. Um, I personally expect once this comes out, there'll be a lot more of this kind of stuff out there in the marketplace for FileMaker, the FileMaker community. So I fully expect as time goes on, I know our system is starting to turn into more of a web <laughs> uh, platform than just pure FileMaker. And I expect that to happen more often that when you go into apps, there's gonna be a lot more layouts that are filled with web components and not really just FileMaker objects and that sort of thing. So, um, FileMaker has also added a few things uh, for iOS and macOS to make your apps smarter. Uh, one of the main things that they added here is uh, integration with Apple's Core ML or machine learning um, framework that is, like I mentioned, for iOS and macOS, so it's not in Windows uh, or WebDirect or anything like that. So, what this is, though, is just computers can now teach themselves to uh, make more accurate predictions based on a model that you give them. Um, the model is something that exists out in the web, or you can create it yourself, but I would suggest just finding, more, more than likely you'll be able to find some kind of model that fits the, uh, the need that you have. Um, so I'll have a demo of a few things out there, um, of a few options that you can do uh, where you, know, you get some feedback from a website or from an email or something like that. The you can put the text in and it can decide whether or not it was a, a good email or a bad email. So you can decide if that needs to be something that a person needs to look at to figure out why that customer is complaining. Um, or you can ha look at a picture and decide who wrote the, who, who uh, was the painter of that picture. Or uh, in this example here, uh, the person, you know, if you don't know, if you're like a warehouse or something, you don't know what part you're looking at, 
you can take a picture of that part um, and then based on the confidence you can see in the, in the, on the right, it'll tell you what it thinks that is. So in this example here, it's pretty much 100% sure it's a fuel filter 33002. Um, so I know we've been, uh, this is something that I think is really cool, but uh, I don't know, does anyone have any examples or ideas of how you guys could use this in your systems? Huh? I know with uh, with myself, we have a customer who has a warehouse where they you know make parts. So this one to me makes sense to if you know keeping track of inventory. You can, if you're if there is just like an open box, there isn't a barcode that they can scan. They can just take a picture and, and throw it into a bin or something, and that will allow them to keep track of their inventory a little bit better. But uh, I'll have a demo of a a few other ideas that you can look at. So um, with the in integrating with CoreML, um, there's a couple things that you would need. It's uh, you first need the ML file. And as I mentioned before, you can find a lot of this stuff online, so you don't have to try to make it yourself. Um, you need a container field for that file. Uh, there's a new script step with the configure machine learning model and then a new function uh, with that compute model and with all that together as you saw on the previous slide it spits out some json which uh, gives your information on what it thinks it is and gives you a list of the you know percentage of confidence uh, another new feature here with mac and ios is the Siri shortcuts. Um, so you can use your voice to run a FileMaker script. In the script workspace, you can see in the um, menu when you go to the scripts, um, you'll be able to right click on a script and you can enable shortcut donation. Uh, basically, this just lets it become a Siri shortcut. When the user opens up their shortcut app in FileMaker, or opens up their shortcut app, uh, they'll see FileMaker Go and then the list of all the scripts that have been donated. Um, the user can then create a large shortcut experience, picking up and choosing from the scripts that you provided, you know, what they want to be able to do. And then I believe finally here, the NFC tags, they've added uh, more features here um, with tag reading. Um, you can read a tag and then have it run a script and then do something based on whatever it, it scans there. So I know with us, a possible example is you could hypothetically have employees each have their own card, uh, like a playing card kind of deal. And then if they, they play Euchre every single day, uh, you can keep track of who wins and who loses by just scanning their cards. Um, so there's a few things that you could do with that, but that was how we use it. Um, with this, the main thing to keep track of is one of the options here is continuous reading. And what that just means is it will continue to scan until the user either, either cancels or the scanning times out. And finally, the thing that we've all been waiting to see, the page count is now something that uh, a function that is inside a FileMaker. Uh, you can put this on side of a print layout and it will give you the total number of pages. So in the past you had could easily do page one of, but then you would have to uh, essentially go into preview mode, go to the last page, figure out what the page is, go back, set a variable, all that fun stuff. So now you don't have to do that. We got page count. Uh, we also now have supported cards in FileMaker WebDirect, which this also includes uh, the adjust window for and remove size or remove move slash resize and uh, the new window script steps. We also have uh, in layout mode, we have the shortcut to be able to switch layouts by name, which is basically quick open. When you're in layout mode, if you hold on um, windows, I believe it's control alt K and in Mac, it is command alt K. Yeah. Um, and what that just does, it kind of brings up the, uh, kind of like the finder window or the little box where you can type in the name of the layout and it'll do a drop down of give you options of the layouts that you can switch to 
and basically lets you switch the layout without having to open up manage layouts and open up a new window. So it makes it a lot easier just to switch between layouts while you're developing. Um, we also have the FM Solutions Upgrade tool. Uh, we have an article on this if you want to learn a little bit more about it. It is in preview, which again, just basically means beta. Uh, it lets you make updates to if a FileMaker system uh, by adding creating new sections into it. It still has a little bit of work to go, in my opinion, but that's why it is a preview or beta. But one day, hopefully soon, we'll be able to uh, insert patches and changes to a FileMaker system without having to port them manually. So it'll make it a lot easier for the development process. Uh, we also have the open a file when FileMaker Pro starts, which just basically means this was an XML option in the past, but now it is something that's just in the uh, user interface in FileMaker, uh, where you can just tell FileMaker that when you open up FileMaker, just open up this FileMaker right away, or, or uh, this database right away. Uh, let's see, we also have links to Claris Marketplace directly inside of the product, inside of FileMaker. Um, with server, startup restoration is off by default, I believe. Start restoration is now classified as a preview or beta option. Um, so that's why it's not off by default. And with FileMaker 18, it had some issues with some of our customers. So good thing that that's off by default right now. Um, create files. Uh, one thing that you can do that you couldn't do before is with FileMaker Cloud, you, don't, you no longer need to create the file locally and then host it you know, upload it and host it to cloud, you can actually take a file or when you're wanting to create a file, you can actually just, if you have FileMaker Cloud, you can directly just create that file on FileMaker Cloud without going through the creating it and uploading it to the cloud. And then finally, a couple of Mac things, they added support for dark mode, Ray dark mode, um, made it so that you can just drag and drop the installer on your hard drive and it automatically installs it into the applications folder and everything. And then lastly, added support for the HEIF image type. So I have a little bit of a demo here for you guys. Let me not cancel that while I get this pulled up. All right, so the first demo I have is for the machine learning. There's a, a few things that you can do inside of here. Uh, the first one that I'm going to show is, we got two of them here uh, that I like. There's the first one, and again, all these um, models that you need can be found online, and in this demo here, they have the where you can get them off of. These were mostly off of uh, GitHub, it looks like. But uh, so with this one, this just tries to identify, you know, what the scenery that you're looking at. Um, so by us loading it in and running the model, this basically right here uh, runs that script step that we were looking at earlier, the configured machine learning, which basically says, okay, this one is a vision, just basically means that that's the image. Uh, we give it a name and then also the field, which is where the model is coming from. And then the compute model is what we, are seeing here. Um, so we run the model here. It is 82% sure we're looking at a lakeside, lakeshore, um, and then it significantly drops to being maybe it's a dam, maybe it's a sandbar, uh, maybe it's a couple other things. Um, and a similar thing here with the age, you can uh, load it up and run the model. And this is again, this is another model that you can just find online and given a picture it thinks that this person is between the ages of 25 and 32. Uh, it's 86% uh, confident on that. And then again, it drops down. Um, I did test this out with my own picture and I wasn't too pleased with it. Uh, it thought I was 48, maybe 38, maybe 100. Um, it, it thinks I'm more likely to be speed to 100 than my actual age area. So I was, I guess. It seems just, accurate. <laughs> I seem like I'm a pretty old soul, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, well, thank you, Agenet. I appreciate it. 
Uh, but a couple uh, of the things that I was saying that you could do in this example that they have, um, if, you know, given some reviews here, if I go in here and I change this, so right now it thinks it's a positive. So it, yeah, it gives it a thumbs up that this was a positive review. If I go in here and say, this is terrible, it uh, automatically, oh, uh, load it, yeah, okay. it automatically looks at this and realizes, yep, this is not a good review. So, um, you know, you could implement this in parts of your system. Uh, if you have customer interactions or feedback, I know with us, we get, uh, we get feedback. So we could possibly use this as a way of quickly identifying if someone is unhappy or not with our surveys. Uh, so there's the core ML. If anyone had any more questions on that, I can dive deeper. But then the other demo that I wanted to show is on the JavaScript side of things. And let me go ahead and just close this one. How long does it take to set up the core ML? Uh, not long at all, as long as you have the model. That's the main thing. Um, where would you get a model? So Apple has a website where they have a bunch of models, but uh, Google is also a great resource where if you, have, you just pull up Google and do a search on it, you'll be able to find a lot of uh, modeling options. But Or you can do your and own and teach it yourself. But And it doesn't work on Windows, correct? Correct. This is only for Mac and iOS. So maybe you said it, but what is a model? Model is basically just a file that has all of the, all of that machine learning and everything built into it. It's like an algorithm. Yeah. Okay. No one, no one really understands it, Mike. Nah. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> it's magic. Why do you have to question magic, Mike? Where's Aaron? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, th I think the idea is you have to have different models for different types of things yeah um like whether it's image recognition or text recognition you, it, it's you gotta it, it has to be the algorithm needs to be programmed in a particular way yeah if we if we look if i go back to here in this uh example file i have for the machine learning if i can find my mouse again uh, each one of these has a different model that gets put into it so it's not just one model it's like if, if i want to be able to guess someone's age i have to download the or i have to create or download someone else's model that they put together for it which is just stored in a container right yeah yeah cool coolio um with the javascript side of things uh, as i was mentioned before uh, there's just the two scripts here. You got the perform JavaScript in web viewer and filemaker.perform script, which they essentially are just inverses of each other. Uh, one does something inside of the JavaScript and the other one does something inside of the filemaker for JavaScript. So a simple example here, you got uh, some pretty short, simple code that this is generating this web viewer here and this submit button runs this perform script on JavaScript or this script from JavaScript and then this update web viewer runs a script that then updates here so both ways if I change this to let's say whatever that is I'm assuming that's eight or nine if I hit submit that then updates this to nine uh, if I wanted to change this back to one and click this it updates the web viewer back to one so this is this, a very simple rudimentary example of how it works uh, just to show you that sort of thing so all these can be changed uh, testing, I want to change this back to whatever that is, probably five-ish, and do that, and hit submit, and it's going to update all these things on that side. Um, the more pretty look is something like this, where, again, top is a web viewer, bottom is FileMaker, and, uh, you know, we got these two graphs. This graph is completely driven off of the data that's inside of here. But if I click on here, I can make it automatically get myself in a found set of records for all the donations that are from that are a large donation or a medium donation or a small donation, that sort of thing. But if I go in here and change this, I can directly affect, I'll just make that a large, large number. So we can quickly see that those two are interacting with each other. There's no FMP URLs or anything clunky going on 
these are just essentially two scriptings telling each other, hey, here's some information, do something with that. Hey, here's some information, do something with that. So um, a lot of this stuff, again, is open source. You can find open, open source stuff online for practically anything that you're looking for. Uh, and then go from there and make some really cool stuff inside of FileMaker. Any questions on that? Cool. Um, are you going to go over the kind of oddities of Java, the integration, JavaScript integration later, or, or should I bring that up? I know I've kind of dealt with yeah. that more than. You can, yeah, you want to bring it up? What, what are you talking about? Um, yeah, so the filemaker.perform script in a web viewer, um, it it doesn't load in it doesn't load that ability till after everything is loaded. So you can't call filemaker.perform script um, like on load up. Um, yeah, because it it, it, it gives you an error. It gives you an error though, right, Mason? That if it has, yeah, it'll give you an error. Yeah. But um. So if you want to run something like the load in data as soon as the web viewer loads, um, what I've been doing, I don't know if this is the best way, but uh, you basically uh, keep calling the script. Uh, you basically make it a loop that keeps trying until the library is available and then you can call it. It usually takes, in my experience, it's taken like 80 milliseconds. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and then the other kind of weird thing is if you if you call three scripts at the same time, so you call script one, two, and three in that order, mm -hmm. um, FileMaker will actually execute them in the opposite order. FileMaker will do three, two, one. Um, it's very strange behavior. So hmm. um, they have what I've been doing is so I, I've been wrapping them in promises, so I don't let my JavaScript call the next script till that one finishes. So you're saying that if FileMaker calls a JavaScript one two three, it does it three two one. No, I'm saying if JavaScript calls yeah. FileMaker, that's what you said. I see. Uh, if from from JavaScript to FileMaker, um, yeah, it'll call them opposite order if you do them one after another. Hmm. Is that, is that it, because it, the way that that behaves, it, it puts it at the top of the call stack? I know that's different behavior than I think. You know, yeah, URLs. exactly. It's a little different behavior than we're used to, but yeah, it puts it at the top of the call stack. Um, so yeah, it's just a little, a little something to know. Yeah, no, I, I did not know that one, so I'm glad you told me so I didn't run across that too. Uh, <laughs> cool. Okay, so that's all I had for demoing for right now. So let's get back into the slide. Got the last couple ones I'm almost done here. All right, so some quick little additional information here. Um, this part is just name uh, only. There's really no changes here, but since FileMaker is now Claris FileMaker, um, you got the Claris ID, Claris Customer Console. Um, the, there's no longer FileMaker Pro Advanced, just FileMaker Pro. So the main point with here is if you had anything in your scripting that looked for you know, pattern count of advanced or something like that, um, you're gonna have to make some changes there. And yeah, it's now not the FileMaker platform, it's just Claire's FileMaker. So just a little bit of rebranding there with FileMaker 19. Um, here uh, with the tech specs of FileMaker, main things to note here is that Windows is now only 64-bit with FileMaker 19. Um, so there's no 32-bit version of FileMaker on Windows um, or in general. So that means, you know, Anyone that's using Outlook or something, make sure you have oops, hit the wrong button there. Make sure you have everyone on uh, Outlook version 64-bit, <laughs> so that still works when you try to send an email. Uh, and then they've also dropped support for Windows 7 and Windows Server 2012 for FileMaker Pro and Server. Um, so make sure that everyone's up on the most recent versions of the operating systems for Windows. They have now finally, 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 hallelujah, gotten rid of runtimes inside of FileMaker 19 moving forward. So it was deprecated back in FileMaker 14, which is more or less just meant they stopped supporting it and doing anything with them. But it was still in the platform until now. 
Um, if anyone has used a runtime recently, um, you've known that on more recent operating systems, they've become essentially useless. Uh, the screen drawing doesn't work anymore. You have to like resize the window and stuff to get things to work. And anyways, so many things that are wrong with it now that FileMaker just finally put the kibbutz on it and it is done. Um, so no more need to worry about runtimes. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer has been added to the deprecated list. Uh, it's still function, it's still usable. Uh, the main thing to note that is really the only reason that FileMaker thinks anyone should be using it is for FileMaker Go development. So that way you can have your iPad or whatever work with uh, whatever FileMaker Go software you're developing and you can just kind of test with it on the fly without having to keep uploading and pulling back and forth the file. You could also just put it on a server would be my recommendation, but I digress. And then, as I uh, mentioned earlier at the top of this presentation, that FileMaker is going to have more or more frequent product release cycles. Um, so they're committed to supporting the FileMaker platform for the next two years um, from the date of the release of FileMaker 19. Uh, if you don't have an annual subscription, you'll get support updates. Oh, hit that button again. Uh, you'll get updates on support uh, of just like security updates, that kind of thing, but any new features uh, you won't get. So you'll have to make sure that you have an active annual subscription or maintenance agreement or something like that that hasn't expired. And if you have that, you'll automatically get all the new features and things like that um, for the next two years. Questions? Comments, concerns? CentOS, yeah, they released the Linux version that's uh, uh, beta, essentially, preview. Yeah. yeah. Which I'm excited for. I have yeah. not tried it myself, but I, I also haven't tested it myself. But I imagine since it is, you know, running server, there's less overhead. Um. Hi. Can I ask a question? Um, I came a little late to the thing. My name's David. Yep. Hey, David. No problem. Um, I uh, am a little leery of JavaScript because of previous experiences with earlier versions and security updates, locking me out of FileMaker server installs and so forth. Um, I've kind of kept it away from me the whole time since. And I, I wonder what kind of... Um, security extra concerns there might be or or uh, shifting versions the problems that might come up well, I think that I guess Mason you can oh, jump in if you have any uh, anything different to say but I would think that since it's all I mean all the JavaScript and everything is is packaged inside of your filemaker app but I don't know what I don't know if you are you talking about like the like the active X active X thing that sometimes pops up like on Windows that sort of security thing. I, I guess I don't know what security concerns you're, you're talking well, about. Well, there were different versions of Java, and after certain updates to FileMaker Server, you couldn't use the old version anymore. Oh. So that's these that's kinds of Java. Nightmare. Yeah. So uh, uh, Java, Java and JavaScript are different in this context. I mean, oh, am I conflating one. the two? Okay, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So J JavaScript is purely just a, a web developing scripting software or programming language that. Um, technically, it's yeah. Technically, it's called ECMAScript. It's not even uh, related. But uh, do, do you even require Java at all anymore for the server? Yeah. If you want yeah. Yeah. You have to install yeah. uh, you have to install Open Java or pay for no. Oracle Java now because they no longer for web publishing. For web yeah. publishing. Okay. I didn't know if it was still in 19. I hadn't tried. I haven't it's, done that install yet in 19. It's not. It doesn't come with 19. Hey. Only for web publishing. Correct. Hey Mason, yeah. would Linux FileMaker Server on Linux would it make it possible to then containerize FileMaker Server? Uh, I mean, I would assume so. Yeah. I don't know if there would be any benefits to doing that, but that becomes I don't know if that's you know something that could be beneficial to some people, maybe verticals. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it could. Um, I don't know. I'm still on the fence about whether it's worth it uh, so far. All my experiences with uh, containers have been terrible. So, 
<laughs> oh, fair, fair enough. I just don't think I know enough. Um, but potentially. Cool. I think we're all just going to put our servers on Raspberry Pis now, right? That's the plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got a mobile file maker server on my pocket. I mean, I, I, mean, I do have like a, uh, a quad quad core Raspberry Pi. So, what are we waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> that could be our, our article next month, Mike. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I don't know if we we have access to the CentOS install yet. Yeah, we do. But oh, we do. Oh, cool. yeah. Actually, I think it was a uh, any or at least anyone that has a developer subscription going to get at. Well, it's it's on our. Uh, oh. It's on the download page for like when you go to our download page, like download FileMaker 19 or anything like that. It's a list of options for server downloads. You got Mac. Yeah, they really oh. kind of as, a, as a public preview. Oh, yeah. I had no idea. Cool. Maybe that should be our next article. I want to know more about that. <laughs> yeah, it's just it, being preview. I'm, you know, I wouldn't want to put it into a production environment, but it'd be nice to put on like a dev server just to try it. Yeah. I mean, it's you install it and then you have the admin council. It's a server. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Brenda, did you go over any of the execute data API? Was that in your slide too? It was not. I did not remember that. <laughs> this is why we got that it. is one feature that I, I thought was dumb at first, but uh, I have since seen the light and um, it's, gonna, it's really useful for uh, some of these JavaScript uh, integrations. Um, it makes it really easy to query the database without leaving the layout. It gives you all the data back in a nice JSON format. Yeah, um, and it also lets you query. Is basically making everything context independent from the JavaScript side of things. Exactly. So it actually makes it really nice to be able to do that. And that'd, then, make um, easier, that'd make it easier that when FileMaker makes an add-on version of JavaScript stuff, that would make it easier as an add-on, right? Because it doesn't. It doesn't really matter where. It doesn't, doesn't matter where you place it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, it also has a couple additional abilities. Uh, I don't know if they were formally documented, but uh, you can query layouts to get uh, metadata, um, you know, figure out what fields are on layouts, stuff like that, mm -hmm. and get uh, value lists. So it's kind of cool. I should add that stuff too. The slides and and the file. Did you have the file path conversions? Oh, forgot that one too. <laughs> yeah. uh, In my defense, some, uh, FileMaker told me what the important stuff was, and apparently FileMaker didn't consider those important. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're important. Uh, yeah, there's there's new commands that let you convert file paths from FileMaker to um, whatever version, like to a, a Mac version of a file path. They also have the ability to change uh, a FileMaker path to a file URL path, which lets you use, like in a in a web viewer, if you like exported a file to the temp drive, is like let's say you exported your your JavaScript to the temp drive, mm -hmm. um, you take the URL that you get, you know, that you exported it as, and you convert it to um, a file URL path. Okay. So you can do like file colon slash slash and then all of that, um, and then you can use JavaScript from your temp drive um, pretty easily. So that was a, another trick I'm, I learned recently. So cool. But I think that's I think that's the last cool feature I know. So <laughs> cool. Anybody else? Fortunately, we don't have people or anything to share. I'll, I'll go make some. I guess we can sit around the campfire and I can pass them out as long as we're six feet apart. All right. All right. Well, no one else has any questions? No. Be good. Is anyone doing any JavaScript? Has anyone got any JavaScript cool stuff planned? Any Kanban boards, calendars, anything? I think you're the driver of our cool stuff, Mason. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. 
Um, All right, thanks, Brendan. Yep, thanks, guys. Um, I think we'll be uploading the video. If anyone came in later, missed anything, um, we'll be adding this to YouTube or make it accessible in some way. So thanks, everybody. Have a good one.